All right, hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, we are starting a new unit today. Uh, this unit is on thermodynamics, and this is gonna be a little bit different than some of the things that we've studied in the past. Now, thermodynamics, as the name implies, with thermo being about heat and dynamics, meaning movement, is really gonna be about the motion and the flow of heat between different objects. So we're gonna start off this first lesson, and that's what we're gonna talk about mostly. We're gonna talk about heat, and we're gonna talk about temperature. Now, you're probably already familiar with the idea of temperature, and depending on where you live you will probably use one of two different scales to measure that either Fahrenheit or Celsius so whichever scale you use of course you can convert between the two by some sort of conversion factor but the key to recognize is that we are going to do all of our calculations in another scale called Kelvin so the Celsius and the Kelvin scales have the same increments which means if you go up by one degree Celsius you go up by one Kelvin they have the same value but they start at different points so whereas um, Celsius at zero degrees we might notice that that's where water will freeze and that's what the Celsius scale is based on we notice that that is at a value of 273.16 Kelvin whereas if we go as cold as possible, all the way down to something called absolute zero, absolute zero happens at negative 273 degrees Celsius, and that happens at something called zero Kelvin. And that's actually where the idea of absolute zero comes from. It's the coldest we can ever get, and so we start our Kelvin scale at zero. So to convert between the two, uh, you can just take your, your, your value in Celsius and subtract um, 273 degrees, and that will give you your value in Kelvin. So, you probably have a sense already that when you look at objects on a microscopic scale, if I take an example of say some water molecules and I zoom in on them, these water molecules are very, very, very cold. You can see that they're sitting at 34 Kelvin that even though they're very cold, they still have energy. And, and that energy, it means they're gonna be moving. So these particles have energy that causes them to just kind of move back and forth. And this is gonna be true of anything, whether it's a solid or liquid or gas. You also probably know that if I were to add heat to this situation, that the motion of those particles is going to increase and that the more heat I add, the more they move around. Now you might notice, notice that these water molecules are moving in a bunch of different ways. They're moving side to side and up and down in a trend translational way, but they're also rotating and spinning around. So all of that motion uh, is related to energy. So the more heat I add to something, the more energy the particles are going to have. And you might also know that if I add enough heat, then some of those particles are going to start to break away and change phases from solid to liquid and gas. Now we're not going to dive too far into phase changes at this point, but if you just kind of understand that that's the way these things work. So when we look at something on a microscopic scale, we see that molecules are always in constant motion. The only time they're not moving would be if you were to get them all the way down to zero Kelvin. And of course, it's not possible in the real world to get anything down to zero Kelvin, absolute zero, because then there would be no energy whatsoever and the particles would not be moving at all. So as you heat these particles up, the motion increases. So there must be a relationship between the kinetic energy of the particles and the heat that flows in or out of that system. Now, macroscopic and microscopic kinetic energies are gonna be treated separately, okay? Now, what do we mean by this? Well, if I was to uh, put a cup of coffee on the table and ask you how much energy it has, you might look at it and say, well, it's not moving and it's, it's on the table, so it's got no kinetic energy, no potential energy, and of course you'd be correct. But if I put a glass of ice water right beside that cup of coffee and ask you which one has more energy, you'd also be correct to say, well, that cup of coffee is really hot. And so it has must have this thermal energy that I've heard about. And so, yeah, the cup of coffee would have more energy than the glass of ice water. Even though it doesn't have any translational kinetic energy, the particles themselves are moving more. So the particles have kinetic energy, more kinetic energy, say, than the ice water. And so we're gonna think about these two things separately. If I, take a, if I take a mug of coffee and chuck it through the air and give it a bunch of kinetic energy, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gonna speed up the motion of the particles on a microscopic scale. And so we're gonna kind of treat those two ideas separately. Now, the last thing to recognize is that some of the macroscopic properties uh, that we see of materials is gonna depend on the average 
of its microscopic properties. Now, what we mean by that is, if I look at, again, if I take a look at these particles moving around, you can see that those particles are, they're just chaotic. They're moving in all directions. And of course, they don't all have the same kinetic energy because they're all moving at their own different speeds. But on average, if I know something about the average amount of kinetic energy these particles have, then I can come to some conclusions at a macroscopic scale. So, um, now we want to think about there's three terms that we're going to use often and in everyday language these terms get thrown around and kind of used interchangeably but in physics they have their own very special meanings and those terms are temperature, thermal energy and heat. You might talk about heating up your food and really well what are you saying are you talking about the thermal energy or the temperature or both. So the temperature is the first one that you're probably most familiar with. Now temperature is going to be a property that's related to the average kinetic energy. So temperature is related to the average kinetic energy of the particles. So if I go back to my example of the cup of coffee, and the uh, cup of ice water, well, on average, the particles inside the coffee are moving around faster, so they're at a higher temperature. That doesn't mean all the particles are, but the average is, and so the temperature is higher. Thermal energy, by comparison, thermal energy is all about the total. It's the total kinetic energy of the particles. Now, um, the last term here is heat. Now heat often gets like interchanged with thermal energy, but technically it's different. Heat is all about the flow of thermal energy. Okay, so you might say that, well, that cup of coffee, as it sits there, it has a bunch of thermal energy locked away in it. And then over time, as it sits on the counter, that thermal energy will flow in the form of heat into its surroundings. So heat really is the movement of thermal energy from one object to the next, which is really what thermodynamics is all about. So if I was to ask you, which one has more thermal energy, a fresh cup of hot coffee or a snowman? Well, at first glance, you might think the cup of coffee. The coffee definitely has a higher temperature. But in actual fact, it's the snowman. The snowman has more thermal energy. And why is that? Well, that's because thermal energy is not an average. Thermal energy is a total. So there are more, there are more particles in the snowman. Okay. Now one way to visualize that is say, okay, um, if you were to take that hot cup of coffee and dump it on top of the snowman, would the average, where would the average temperature end up? Well, when you combine those two things, the average temperature would end up much closer to the original temperature of the snowman than it did to the original temperature of the hot cup of coffee, right? Okay, so with thermodynamics, there's actually a number of laws that we're gonna learn that are gonna kind of dictate how heat is gonna flow between different objects and what that's going to mean. Um, the first one we're going to talk about was not the first one to be discovered. It's something called the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So it turns out that um, scientists had discovered the first and second law of thermodynamics and kind of went backwards and said, oh, wait a second, we need to, we need to define this zeroth law so that we can, the rest of our laws kind of make sense. And the zeroth law says, okay, imagine you've got, an, uh, you've got three objects, object A and B and C. Okay. Now, if object A is in e thermal, e thermal equilibrium with object B, and object B is in thermal equilibrium with object C, then what that means is by the zeroth law, then they are all, they are all at the same temperature. Now, what does that mean? What that means, essentially, i.e. heat will not flow between them. Now, what this basically does, it might sound like a, well, yeah, obviously, if A is the same temperature of B and B is the same temperature as C, then A and C are the same temperature. Well, that sounds kind of obvious. But what this basically does is it says, look, what is going to dictate whether heat flows or not is the temperature. 
not the internal energy. You can see objects A and B and C might be all different sizes, right? Object C might have more thermal energy total in it, but heat is not going to flow from C to A because they have the same average. So temperature, the average kinetic energy, is what's going to dictate the direction of heat flow, okay? We can go back to our example of the coffee in the snowman because even though the snowman has more energy total in it because of its size, the temperature of the coffee is higher than that of the snowman, which means heat is going to flow from the hot coffee to the snowman. Uh, something to think about. What happens if you uh, hammer a nail on the head with a hammer? Okay, what happens to the temperature of the nail? Well, you might notice that it increases. Now, um, where does that energy come from? Well, where does that temperature come from? The heat that flows into the nail happens because the hammer does work on the nail. So the hammer does work. Now, what this leads us to is this idea that um, that there's different forms of energy, but really they're still all versions of the same thing. So I can do work on something to potentially increase its uh, its internal energy, its, um, its thermal energy. And maybe, maybe we can get thermal energy to do work for us in some other situation. So when we add heat to something, when we heat something up, typically what happens is the temperature is going to increase. And you can see that I put a little asterisk there, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the amount that the temperature increases is not going to be the same for every object. So we have a formula that's going to predict how this works. And it goes like this, Q equals MC delta T. So you can imagine, for example, you've got like a lump of iron and you stick it in a fire, okay? So uh, as the heat flows into the iron, the temperature of the iron is going to increase. So we'll define all these terms. The first one here is Q. So Q is the symbol that we're going to use for heat. So this tells us the amount of heat that flows into our material. Now M will be um, nothing new for you, that's mass. Obviously if I have a large lump of iron, uh, I would need more heat to flow into it to increase its temperature than if I had a little tiny chunk of iron. And then we've got delta T here on the end, and delta T is going to be the change in temperature. And again, if I want to increase the temperature of my lump of iron by 100 degrees, that's going to take more energy than if I only want to increase it by, say, 10 degrees, right? So the last one here to think about, the last term, is this uh, term C. And C is something called the specific heat capacity. Now, that's a new term, and that's something that's a little bit different, so it's going to take some thinking about. It turns out that not all materials heat up at the same rate. So for example, if I was to um, take 100 joules of heat and have it flow into a kilogram of water, and then 100 joules of heat flowing into a kilogram of air, those two things are gonna heat up by different amounts because they have different specific heat capacities. Basically, they require a different amount of heat in order to cause their temperatures to increase. Now, this the reasons for this are actually pretty complex. They have to do with the molecular interactions uh, down on the microscopic scale. But for our purposes, we can just think of the specific heat capacity is how much energy does it take to increase one kilogram of material by one Kelvin. And so the units for specific heat capacity are joules per kilogram Kelvin, right? Now, what do I mean by this usually, or this little asterisk here that I've included? Well, what we'll see later is, while this is gonna be true for solids and liquids, um, if you have a gas, then really actually the temperature might change or the pressure might change. So what we'll just say here is, this is true at a constant pressure. And we're gonna come back and talk about temperature and pressure and ideal gases in another lesson. So, um, you can see here I've got a table of uh, I've got a table of specific heat capacities, uh, and you can see that, for example, like water has a specific heat capacity of four thousand one hundred eighty-six, whereas copper only has a specific heat capacity of 
387. So what that means is if I have a kilogram of water and a kilogram of copper, well, it's going to take a lot more energy, a lot more heat's going to have to flow into that water in order to increase its temperature compared to the copper. And again, that just depends on the little molecular interactions of of the particles themselves. I guess what that means is that copper particles, copper atoms are easier to get moving back and forth really quickly compared to water molecules because the water molecules have a lot of inter and intramolecular forces um, at play. Okay, so I've got a question here. It says, from what height would you need to drop a raw chicken so that it has enough energy to cook on impact? Um, we're gonna have to make a few assumptions here uh, because this is kind of a strange question. So the first thing I'm gonna assume is that uh, I'm gonna drop a chicken from very high up and that somehow all of the energy, all of the potential energy uh, from dropping that chicken is gonna get transformed into heat and transferred to the chicken. I do suspect that a raw chicken hitting the ground is not gonna be a 100% efficient process, but let's just assume that that's the case uh, for this one here. Now, a few other assumptions I'm gonna to have to go with are um, like, how big is a chicken? So the mass of a chicken, um, I don't know about you, but uh, I would say a chicken has a mass of three kilograms. I'm no chicken expert, but that seems like a good mass for chickens. Um, my initial temperature, the initial temperature of my chicken, it just came out of the fridge and my fridge is at four degrees Celsius. So that simplifies things. And um, I happen to know, because I do like to cook, that the temperature of a cooked chicken is actually at 74, uh, 74 degrees Celsius is the temperature for cooked chicken, which is like 165 Fahrenheit. And then um, the last thing we need to make an assumption about is, I have no idea what the specific heat capacity of a chicken is, but I do know that chickens are mostly water. And so let's just use the specific heat capacity for water. So 4,186 uh, joules per kilogram uh, Kelvin. All right. Now, one thing to note here uh, is that I'm interested not really just in the raw uh, or the, 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 the initial and final temperature. What I'm interested in is the change in temperature. So the change in temperature you can see here is going to be 70 degrees Celsius. Now, because Celsius and uh, Kelvin have the same increments, then that also corresponds to a change of 70 Kelvin, right? 70 Celsius is not the same as 70 Kelvin, but a change of 70 is. So I can calculate the heat required to cook a chicken using MC delta T. And so uh, the mass of the chicken is three. Um, the specific heat capacity is 4,186. And the change in temperature, I need to increase it by 70 degrees. And this corresponds actually to quite a bit of energy, 879,000 joules, or just about uh, that many joules, which is actually quite a lot. And this is just one of the properties of water. Uh, water is just actually really difficult to change its temperature. It's one of the amazing things about it. So um, I need a lot of energy. So how high am I gonna have to drop this from? Well, I guess the potential energy I start with is gonna have to equal the heat needed to flow into my chicken. And so this is going to equal MGH. And so H is gonna equal the heat divided by MG, which is 879,060 divided by my three kilograms times 9.8. And I get a somewhat surprising result here. I get 29,900 meters is how high I need to drop this from. So I would have to I would have to drop this chicken from a pretty substantial height in order for it to cook. And so maybe it's actually gonna cook because of all the, the heat friction when it reaches terminal velocity um, before it hits the ground. Okay, last thing we need to talk about is we need to talk about um, the three ways that heat gets transferred between objects, okay? So the three forms of heat transfer. And so heat can transfer between objects through conduction, convection, or radiation. And a great way to visualize this actually is to, to take a look at this fire that I've got here. If I was to take a metal poker and stick it in the fire, well, then the, the heat from the fire would transfer through that hot poker and eventually it would reach my hand and would travel through the metal. And we would call that conduction. Whereas if I put my hands above the fire, I might feel warm air rising off the fire. That's, that's a way of transfer called convection. And last but not least, even if I'm beside the fire, uh, I might actually feel the warmth, not so much from the air coming off of the fire, but just actually from the radiation of the electromagnetic radiation, and we call that um, radiation. So the first one uh, is heat conduction. And so heat conduction is uh, the conduction of heat through contact.
okay? Conduction is gonna happen when it goes through a material um, and reaches you. So just imagine, imagine this poker that's sitting in the fire. Now I'm gonna draw a really simplified example of it. So imagine I've got this poker and one end is uh, is sitting in the fire, okay? So this end, there's, there's heat flowing in to this end here. Well, you could think about um, how much heat flows. And so what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about the rate of heat transfer, and that's gonna be Q over T. So how quickly will heat flow through this poker from one end to the next? And so you can imagine it's gonna depend on a few different, uh, a few different properties. Like for example, um, the cross-sectional area of, of the material, right? If I have a wider cross-sectional area, then more heat can flow. So one of the factors is going to be the area. But another one is going to be the temperature difference, so delta T. And so the rate of heat transfer is going to depend on the differences in the temperatures. If I put one end of the iron poker into, say, a glass of water at 50 degrees Celsius, well, heat's going to transfer through, but it's not really going to move that quickly. Whereas if I stick it into a fire that's at 2000 degrees Celsius, well, then heat's going to transfer a lot more quickly. Um, and of course, the distance that it needs to travel is going to change this as well. If the poker is uh, one centimeter long, well, then the heat can transfer through it very quickly, whereas if it's a meter long, it's going to be much different. So I'm going to divide this whole thing by L, because the further the heat has to travel, the slower the transfer is going to be. Now, the last term I need to add here, I'm going to call K. I'm just going to throw that in front, and that's one of the things we do in physics, because there's a constant here that's going to kind of dictate this too, because it's going to depend on what the heat is transferring through. So if, for example, my poker is made of iron, it's going to travel heat's going to travel through it at a different rate than if, for example, the poker is made of wood. Heat um, travels more easily through metal than it does through wood, and so that's going to be that difference there. So let's just, let's just make sure we've got an understanding of all these terms. So Q over T really is the rate of heat transfer, and K is something called thermal conductivity. Now, thermal conductivity is going to depend on the material that it's made of. So you can see there's another chart here with a bunch of random thermal conductivity constants. And so iron has a thermal conductivity of about 80, whereas copper has a thermal conductivity of 399. Basically, this means that heat is going to transform more quickly through copper than it does through iron. Um, and so A is our cross-sectional area. And delta T, and this delta T is different from our previous, form, previous formula. Delta T in this case refers to the temperature difference. And it's the temperature difference between the two areas that heat is flowing through. So it would be the temperature of the fire compared to the temperature on the other end of the, uh, of the conducting rod. And then, of course, L is our length. Now the units here for, for heat transfer are is, um, is heat divided by time, so that would be joules over second, which would be the same as a watt. Okay, so imagine uh, I've got a house, and uh, this house has wood walls that are five centimeters thick. I know that houses typically have insulation and other things, but bear with me. So we've got five centimeters uh, uh, thick wood walls, and the temperature outside is 15 degrees, and inside is 20 degrees Celsius. Um, how thick of a wall would we need if it was made out of aluminum so that we have the same rate of heat transfer? So if I make my walls out of five centimeters of wood, how thick would the wall have to be out of aluminum so that I keep the rate of heat transfer the same? Now, um, you can imagine that what this means is that the rate of heat transfer through the wood would have to equal the rate of heat transfer through the aluminum. Okay, so basically these two rates have to stay the same, which means that the thermal conductivity of the wood times the area times the uh, temperature difference divided by the length of the wood or the thickness would have to equal the thermal conductivity of aluminum times the area times the temperature difference time, uh, divided by the length or the thickness of the aluminum. Now, because we're talking about building the same house and the same walls and everything, the areas would cancel out and then so would the differences in the temperature because we're trying to separate them in the same space. So essentially what I end up with is um, a ratio that says the thermal conductivity of the wood divided by its length 
equals the thermal conductivity of the aluminum divided by its length. And so I can solve for the length of the aluminum by just um, solving this algebraically. And so I end up with Ka over Kw times length W. And now I can check my chart here. The thermal conductivity of aluminum is 237. It's right there on my chart. So 237, which means it's pretty darn good at um, sending heat through it. Compare that to wood, and in this case, this gives me a value of 0 0.087, meaning it's actually a pretty good insulator. It's not going to allow heat to transfer very easily. And then I'm going to multiply this by the thickness of the wood wall, which is 0 0.05 of a meter. Now, when I crunch these numbers, what I end up with is a total of 136 meters, which means very thick aluminum walls, which is probably why uh, we don't make our walls, well, one of the reasons anyways, we don't make walls for our houses out of metal because they're gonna conduct that, that energy far too efficiently. This is also why, for example, why if you um, go into a room and you pick up something metal or you touch something metal, it almost always feels colder than its surroundings. It must be actually at the same temperature because if it wasn't, then heat would flow into it. But it feels cold because when you touch it, it conducts heat from your hands very quickly and rapidly away. And so all of a sudden your hands are at a lower temperature than they were previously. Okay, so we've got two more kinds of, of, uh, of heat flow that we need to talk about. So in addition to conduction, we've got convection. Now convection is the transfer of heat by the motion of a fluid. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, imagine we've got um, like a, we've got a beaker, like you see here, sitting on a Bunsen burner, and so you, we're heating it up. So heat is flowing into this uh, this beaker full of water. Well, what's going to happen is as the particles right next to the Bunsen burner become uh, well, as they heat up, they're going to become less dense. And so they're gonna to start to flow upwards. And as they flow upwards, that's gonna force other uh, more dense particles or more dense, let's say, uh, water to start to flow back down. And so as a result, overall, this convection is like a current that's gonna get set up where the warmer water is gonna rise up and the cooler water is gonna drop. And this is going to cause the heat to sort of distribute more, more efficiently. Uh, over time. Um, now the thing to recognize about convection and, uh, and conduction, both of these require a medium, which means that if you want to conduct heat, you need to physically touch, and so there's the medium you're traveling through, or if you want to convect heat, then you need to move a fluid, whether it's a liquid or a gas, um, but there has to be something for it to travel through. By comparison, our last form of, of heat transfer, which is radiation, is the transfer of, uh, of by emission of electromagnetic radiation. So electromagnetic radiation. Now electromagnetic radiation, we're going to learn more about that when we talk about optics, but for now just understand that electromagnetic radiation can move through a medium like air or glass or water, or it can move through a complete vacuum through nothing at all. So even everyday objects, like people for example, are emitting radiation into their surroundings, it's just that we can't see it. So normal things like say people might emit infrared radiation. Okay, and so we are emitting, because we're warmer than our surroundings, we are emitting this radiation into our surroundings. We just can't see it because we don't see in the infrared spectrum. Um, but if you were to get a material hot enough, like say take that piece of iron and put it back in the fire, you might heat that piece of iron up enough that it would actually glow, right? So it would glow in the visible range. And this is exactly how light bulbs, well, used to work anyways. If you take a little tiny piece of tungsten and you pass enough current through it, it might get so hot that it starts to glow bright and that's going to produce light that we can actually see. Okay, so that's it for our first lesson on uh, thermodynamics.